Welcome to International Webinar on BT Cotton in India, Myths and Realities which is an evidence-based evaluation being made by acclaimed scientists. Now I welcome Dr. Peter Kenmore. Dr. Peter Kenmore is a MacArthur Fellow, Genius Award, for his work on IPM in Green Revolution Rice, former head of FAO Plant Protection, and former FAO Ambassador to India. Kenmore was the founder of the internationally renowned Farmer Field School program in Asia. He had also served as Executive Secretary of Rotterdam Convention on Prior Informed Consent in International Trade in Pesticides, on FAO, UNEP Global Treaty which coordinates the Global Program on Highly Hazardous Pesticides. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to uh, join uh, back in India and I hope there's a good response and interaction. My background is, as well as uh, you know, having having worked for periods uh, between three weeks and three years over over an overall period of about 40 years, working in India, working in more than 30 districts, usually in rice. Um, but my original background and specialty was in uh, ecology, particularly of rice systems uh, and of uh, pest control and IPM. So from that perspective, uh, BT hybrid cotton is a pest control technology. It's not uh, a salvation to yield. It's not a salvation to uh, production. It's a pest control technology. And now it's getting to be actually quite an aging, an older pest control technology. And we're seeing some of the typical signs of this, both in terms of secondary pest problems and in terms of resistance in pest populations, um, making the actual BT toxin ineffective in the field. Um, this is the, unfortunately for the world, uh, this is the same thing that happened uh, with uh, a number of insecticides, uh, insecticide molecules. I'm listing on the slide you can see now, I think six of them or so. Um, these are classics and I put them up in particular because they have a special relationship often with India. DDT of course has pride of place. Now I've got the, just for, to keep people's attention, I've, I've got the uh, models of the molecular models of each of these and the molecular weight in the now standard units of Daltons. So DDT is a famous uh, pesticide insecticide molecule it is banned for all uses in the world except for control of malaria for public health. And given that exemption under the Stockholm Convention, India is by far the largest producer of DDT, even though it's a persistent organic pollutant with intercontinental uh, transfer. So DDT keeps on pouring into the world uh, and India has a particular place in, in keeping that going, even though there are many alternatives for the control of malaria mosquitoes. Second one, very familiar in India is benzene hexachloride or BHC. One form of it is sometimes called lindane. It's related to DDT and it's a byproduct of industrial coke production. That's a, a, a carbon fuel uh, in India. So it, it was something very easy to make. It is banned by the Stockholm Convention. And so eventually in the mid 1990s, thanks to regulatory courage uh, by the government of India, uh, it was then uh, finally moved out of India and, and banned. Then we have endosulfan, another relative to the chlorinated hydrocarbons, which uh, is highly toxic in aquatic systems and has posed serious health hazards, including in Kerala and Philippines and other places. The fourth one is well known to everyone, I'm sure, at the meeting, monocrotophos, a chlorinate, uh, it's a, sorry, an organophosphate compound with a very high human uh, and toxicity. Uh, I believe that India is, again, the largest producer of monocrotophos. It's, again, it's restricted uh, by several conventions, including the, um, the Rotterdam Prior Informed Consent Convention, and it has caused secondary pest reliefs. You'll be hearing about some of that later in cotton, but also in rice and other crops. Then we have carbaryl, which was previously the most widely used carbamate. And as everyone in this meeting knows, the precursor is isothiocyanate, which created it at Bhopal uh, 
35, six years ago, the largest industrial accident, sorry, yes, the largest industrial accident uh, in human history. Finally, imidacloprid, uh, neonicotinoid, widely used, most widely used insecticide now globally, extremely toxic to honeybees and other pollinators, and used extensively in cotton as a prophylactic seed treatment. So in each of these, you see a molecule of a certain size being, and it'll be, it had the same sequence of ecological problems in the field with resistance, secondary pest release, uh, human and domestic animal toxicity. Now, here I've also put the, a, a form of the molecule we're interested in. Uh, this is the one I could get a picture of. It's the BT cry 2 AA toxin. The reason I put it up twofold. Number one, it is a molecule, just like all the other insecticides. It's treated as if it was insecticide in the development and marketing by uh, the corporations. The only difference is it's about, I don't know, uh, several hundred times bigger than the other molecules. That's as nature as a, bio, as a bio produced uh, molecule, but it again joins the ranks of other insecticides following the same cycle of crisis. Um, <clears throat> the way each molecule went through, uh, they were packaged. Uh, biochemically, legally, and commercially before they're released and promoted, both by private sector and by uh, government agencies with an interest. I use here a picture of a pesticide shop uh, in Gunter district because I visited it. That was in the years long before BT arrived. But the, uh, the point is, is that this, this is the way these chemicals are moved out, even though they're toxic, uh, and cause ecological side effects to uh, the smallest farmers as well as to uh, large-scale uh, wealthier farmers uh, it, across the world. And so corporate and public policy actors often claim increases but deliver no more than temporary pest suppression, and this has tr been true for all the molecules you've seen. It's true not just in cotton, it's true also in rice, it's true in cabbage and other vegetable crops, it is true in orchard, orchard crops like apples. This is a universal set of phenomena. I'm going to particularly look at uh, well, yield increases, but no more than temporary pest suppression. That has been seen in, in problems with even with BT, where yields decline after, uh, in, in some cases in the first year, in some cases after three or four years, you see in the same place standard yield declines. I'm going to talk a little bit more about secondary pest release. You're going to hear about this from Professor Andrew Gutierrez. In cotton, I'm going to show you very quickly a rice case from Asia. Uh, this is a secondary pest release. Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, all the, the brown rice area is dead. This is the rice brown plant hopper, Nila parvata lugans. Every one of these was created by insecticides. The young man in the middle of the top row is uh, holding a bottle of monocrotophos, <clears throat> which is category 1A, 1B uh, WHO toxin. And you can see he has no personal protective equipment. In the lower right is, uh, again, a picture of uh, brown plant hopper released in fields uh, near Aduturai in Tamil Nadu, in Tanjur uh, district. And uh, it's here particularly because you see standing in the middle, uh, Dr. V. Raghunathan, formerly pet, pet <clears throat> the pest control advisor, plant protection advisor, excuse me, for the government of India, who unlike most of his predecessors and successors stands uh, barefoot in rice paddies, listening to farmers who have this problem with the secondary pest release. Um, again, in rice, how, what's the mechanism? At the bottom, you have the pest on the lower left, and then the rest of the organisms here are natural enemies. You can see two of them eating brown plant hoppers. When they are destroyed, as the upper graph show, when those natural enemies are suppressed, the population of the plant hoppers explodes. And that's a secondary pest release. The ecosystem in rice is wonderfully complex, including the blue part is that which takes place under the water. 
uh, surface and the others here are on the rice plants on land, but it's a complex ecosystem that gets disrupted by the pesticides. Uh, now, part of the job in managing an IPM strategy is to regulate pesticides better. Um, this shows uh, pesticide use from 1955 to about 2013 for India uh, in technical grade, which shows that increasing steadily fairly sharply and then moderately sharply uh, from the mid-1950s until the mid-1990s, which point the finance ministry imposed a 10% excise tax on all pesticides at the factory gate, uh, but also at the same time the, the Central Insecticide Committee and the, and the regulatory apparatus uh, was very good at um, getting rid of BHC. And between those two things, the amount of pesticides overall used in India shrank uh, dramatically. The thing that's of interest to us today as well is here you can see where the first plantings of BT cotton happened. And the first plantings happened after the bulk of the reduction in pesticides. So that what you have when one talks about BT cotton uh, reducing pesticide use. In fact, the bulk of the change happened before BT cotton came on the scene. In fact, you can see some pesticide levels going up, or total use levels nationally going up after BT cotton. So recurrent crises of the kind that I've talked about spark citizens, public action, and then sprouted, I call it, ecological field research by committed scientists, so the kind of crisis that we see here, this is shot in India of a small child uh, spraying in a field. Then as just as an icon of citizens public action, this is Rachel Carson uh, at the Rocky Shore where she lived in Maine. And then over here, we have scientists working with farmers directly in field, in this case in cotton fields. <clears throat> when the research is taken on by farmers, so they do it, they create locally adapted agroecological strategies, whether it's zero-based natural farming, farmer field schools, self-help groups, or a number of other social groups. And here you see action pictures of farmers doing science and sharing their scientific observations with other farmers. Finally, their agroecology is gathering global support from citizens groups, governments, all the way up to the UN FAO, where agroecology has been the subject of two big global meetings and five regional meetings, the total attendance, uh, the, the, the latest one of those, the global meeting was 800 uh, international delegates who came to talk about agroecology. Their robust solutions, the farmers robust local solutions in Indian cotton do not require any new molecules, including that nice, gig nice looking gigantic uh, Cry2AA uh, molecule, that's not what's required. What you're gonna be hearing about today are where the kinds of alternative practices uh, are more sustainable and do a better job of taking care of pest problems. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Peter. Uh, I think your presentation uh, was very reflective of our own experience uh, by equating pesticides and uh, GM crops, uh, the particular with the BT cotton, the approach to pest management uh, is unsustainable by taking an approach to killing. I think that was brought out uh, very well in your the, uh, presentation. And this has been the experience of India. And uh, we also have seen uh, where pesticides are not used much uh, and uh, uh, people made a shift from pesticides to uh, more agroecological approaches like non-pesticidal management. The pest problem has come down significantly. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing this out very well in your presentation. 